us to put like eight million lights on his house. Mm -hmm. We had you know, the seven thirty event last night. Light them all up. It was like twenty five minutes. We had eight songs to go with it. Flames oh, coming out of here. Oh, you want everybody to work out? Yeah, I have to work hard. You know, it's unbelievable. I I don't know what. I don't know. Yeah, it's not good. How much he's been playing it, but it's better. I think it's fresh work. Monday. Newer. They said it when he came in. I saw her before the election. I was surprised. How's she doing? World Series wins the Super Bowl. Their fourth Monday. Good evening. Welcome to our regularly scheduled meeting of the Town Council for December 7, 2015. Start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Councilor Latina, if you could lead us. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Councilor Hemmen? Here. Councilor Hurley? Here. Councilor Latina? Here. Councilor Martino? Here. Councilor Rell? Here. Councilor Spinella? Here. Deputy Mayor Barry? Here. And Mayor Montaneri? Here. Thank you. Thanks, Dolores. Uh, we're going to start this evening with a brief moment of silence on behalf of Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day and the veterans uh, associated with that day. Thank you. We have a presentation from the Central Connecticut Health District. Welcome. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of uh, council, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Bridges. Uh, thank you very much for having us this evening. I'm Judy Sartucci. I'm the chairman of the board of the Central Connecticut Health District. Uh, our director of health, Charlie, uh, Charles Brown, will be doing a presentation this evening, uh, but I had just wanted to say a few words to you to thank you for your continued support of the health district and your time and input of your uh, of folks from Weathersfield. With us this evening is uh, the other member of the board currently appointed by the town of Weathersfield, Angela Colantonio. Um, I just wanted to remind the council that you do still have two vacancies on the board and we would encourage you and would welcome uh, you know, new appointments to those positions. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn over to Charles. Thanks, Judith. Thank yeah, you can call me Charlie Brown. It's easier that way. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, reflecting on this, the last time that I came here before the council, uh, I had just been on the job a few weeks. Uh, so actually looking, this is the first time that I've had an opportunity to provide an annual report back to the town where I've actually been here a whole year. Uh, so uh, without that much further ado, I'll jump into the presentation. So um, some general information, because I know that we have some new folks here um, about the Central Connecticut Health District. We are the local health department for the towns of Berlin, Newington, Rocky Hill, and Weathersfield. And we do serve a combined population of about 98,000 people within those four towns. We're one of uh, 20 regional local health departments uh, in the state, and we've been providing a broad range of services for about 19 years the district has been in existence. Uh, next year is our 20th year in operation and we provide what we call the three P's of public health. And I'll get into what those three P's are here in a couple minutes. Um, we have seven full-time employees, four part-time employees that are currently working out of five offices. We have an office in each one of the town halls and in the Newington Senior and Disabled Center. Uh, we also have 
over 50 active professional and lay volunteers that help us do things like flu clinics uh, and, and do the things that we need to do to get things done around the district. Uh, we're, as Judy mentioned, uh, are overseen by a 13-member Board of Health that's made up of myself as the director and then board members appointed by the member towns based on population. And you see the breakdown there uh, within the presentation. The revenues that, uh, for 2014-2015 uh, were a little bit over a million dollars last year. And they're a combination of, of really three main things. One is the amount of money uh, per capita that we get from each of our member towns uh, to help support district operations. Uh, we also get program revenue from license fees, from providing flu vaccinations, and other programs that we run on a fee-for-service basis. Uh, we get grants from the federal, state, and other areas. And we do have a little bit of interest income that we get from the reserves that we carry it because we do operate uh, kind of like a small business. Our expenditures uh, were a little bit under a million dollars last year. Uh, primarily the expenditures we have because we are uh, a service related agency uh, deal with the salaries and employee benefits of, of those people providing those services uh, with some operating expenses and contracts that we have an additional kind of rounding out with. Um, just to give you a brief overview of a difference between healthcare and public health, um, because it's a little bit um, sometimes hard to make that distinction. Uh, healthcare, their primary focus really is on the individual, that person that walks into that doctor's office that needs to uh, be provided with some attention. In public health, we look at the population as a whole. That's our primary focus, is each one of our communities and the populations within that community. Um, in healthcare, when they have an intervention, somebody walks in the door, uh, they really try to look at how they diagnose and treat that particular individual. Or in public health, um, the diagnosis is really along the aspects of assessment. So we're assessing our communities, looking at what the disease rates, looking at what the needs are, and then our treatment aspects are really how we develop policies and how we assure that those policies are effectively and efficiently taken, taking place within the communities. Um, processes within healthcare really focus on the management of patient care. And within public health, we look more on a broad scope, uh, systems management, so to speak, looking at the environment and human behavior and how it affects the health of the community. The outcomes from a healthcare perspective really looks at returning that sick individual back to health. And in public health, our main goal is to ensure that we have a healthy community from the start and that it stays healthy as we move forward. A uh, quick example of this really looks at influenza. So if you look at a healthcare response to influenza, really somebody walks in, they screen them for what risks they have, they try to teach them to prevent you know, the things that they can do individually, and really try to give them that annual flu shot. Um, if they do get sick, they try to provide Tamiflu or medic medications, and they also may treat secondary infections, things that they may come into counter with. Um, and then ultimately they report that individual disease back up to the state health department. From a public health response, we really look at more broad information campaigns. And I've been over the past year on a lot of community uh, television programs. I've been all over the place talking about the things you can do to prevent flu. Get your flu shot, wash your hands, cover your cough, stay home if you're sick. So providing those basic messages out there so that people can help to prevent getting sick in the first place. Uh, in addition to that, we monitor and track uh, the seasonal occurrence of flu. We know that flu happens in, in a season. We monitor that, uh, the disease burden within the community. Um, when we find that um, within the season, we'll target particular populations, provide mass vaccination clinics to address them, and really promote policies within the community, uh, like employer-required vaccination of healthcare, so that um, those individuals who may be at risk and people who may be immunocompromised are protected uh, and protect the community as a whole. So I mentioned the three P's of public health. And when we think about public health, we do think about it in three P's. The, uh, the aspect of preventing disease, promoting healthy behaviors, and protecting the community against threats. So, one of the main things we do in our prevention efforts, and last year we actually were pretty successful in this, was provide a lot of flu vaccinations. Uh, we do 10 mass influenza clinics 
uh, every year, and I've seen some of the folks around these tables uh, through our influenza clinics. Um, and we're getting pretty good at it because we actually use these max vaccination clinics to test our emergency preparedness plans uh, so that we can very efficiently um, actually provide flu shots. Last year, we were a little bit over two minutes from door to door. Once they had the form filled out when they walked in, uh, two minutes later, they were walking out, had the bandage on their arm, and were vaccinated against the flu. And uh, that's a lot of practice. Uh, we run our flu clinics on the incident command system, uh, really utilize those to test our plans uh, if we had to provide these types of services in an emergency. Uh, this year, in addition <laughs> to the regular flu clinics that we uh, offered, we actually did a pilot clinic where we were targeting children and youth within the community. And this is something that we're going to be expanding on in the future because this is one population group that we know if we can vaccinate the kids, if we can vac vaccinate them, that we can help make a major impact on the burden of disease within our communities. Um, in addition to flu, we also had the Putting on Airs program. And this program is where we actually go in the home and do home visits with uh, asthma patients that have been referred to the agency. Uh, we go in with a team of an environmental health professional and an asthma educator, and we look at the home for triggers <coughs> for their asthma. Um, and then we also have an education session where we talk about the medications that they have and really how they utilize those particular medications. And what we found is that the time that we spend, which is about an hour and a half uh, within the home doing these types of things, has a major impact upon the health and, and the outcomes of the, of the individuals that are referred to us. Uh, doctors don't generally have the time to really go through and explain the medications, and there may be issues within the home of where they're, they're working that we can identify and help to mitigate. Um, this has been probably one of, the, one of the big successes I've seen over the last year. In addition to that, we have a radon kit distribution where we actually give out test kits for radon to anybody within the community. And we actually sell bicycle helmets, and it's warm enough right now to ride your bike out there. So I encourage you all to be active there. If you need a helmet, come see us. On promoting healthy behaviors, a lot of the activities that we've had over the past year has really been around our uh, CCHD Achieve Health initiative. And this initiative really looked to engage our partners in the community, in healthcare, in town planning, social services, uh, and business, um, to really look at how we operationalize our community health improvement plan. Uh, we as an agency actually went through the process of community health assessment a few years ago and defined a health improvement plan for addressing what those gaps that, that we found. Uh, so we're utilizing uh, this Achieve Health initiative to really get um, the folks in there to really, how do we make this happen? How do we actually take on the um, activities to make the health in the community improve? One of the things that the Achieve Health did in the last year uh, was around April, we had a walking competition uh, that actually encompassed all four of our member towns. This is the first time that we'd done this across our district and it was pretty successful. It was focused, in, focused on town employees uh, this year and we had 331 employees that participated in the program. They walked over 54,000 miles uh, within six weeks. So that's a pretty heavy step count. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we also had health education efforts. We have a part-time health educator, and she really was out there in the community looking at, at children and how we actually teach them about healthy uh, behaviors to help prevent skin cancer. Uh, she went out to several schools, several camps within the community and talked with them about 330 students uh, to help educate them so that they can protect themselves now and in the future. Protecting our communities is foundational uh, within the things that we do. And our environmental health services really are where the rubber meets the road with respect to protecting our community. Uh, we have um, registered sanitarians and an environmental health inspector, and they've conducted over 2,000 food service temporary event, septic, pool, and salon inspections over the last year. Uh, in addition to those regular inspections, they responded to 266 complaints of various nature and had to work with state's attorney's office, the Department of Public Health, uh, really to start to address really some very complex issues with some of these complaints that realm from uh, housing complaints like heating uh, to even hoarding issues that we find that we come into contact and deal with. 
additionally, when the protection, one of the main protection things that we've done over the past year and in probably over the last 12, 13 years is emergency preparedness planning. Last year's focus, as you may remember from the news, really was around Ebola and the coordination of what we actually would have to do if we had a patient come back from West Africa in the areas that were affected by Ebola. Uh, and we've done a lot of work with our healthcare partners, with our town partners, to ensure that if we did have a patient, we had to monitor them uh, for disease, that we could do that effectively. Additionally, uh, we've spent the last year preparing for a statewide exercise that's coming up this April uh, for medical countermeasure dispensing. Uh, so we're actually gonna be supporting another health district actually testing our plans inside the district and inside the towns by receiving what drugs we would have to do if we had to hand them out for things like anthrax, uh, regular infectious disease along those lines. So we'll be testing our distribution uh, capability uh, here in April to accomplish that. There's a fourth P uh, that we've had to take on here since I've been uh, involved here in the last year and that's preparing for the future. Uh, so our board and staff have worked very hard over the last year to help develop a new five-year uh, agency strategic plan, really focused on the health of our communities in several areas. Uh, one of them is actually how we promote healthy natural and built environments, so uh, both the outside and the inside. Um, looking at health promotion initiatives that support good health through the entire life stage, from cradle to grave. Um, looking at our internal readiness and how we anticipate, recognize, and respond to public health threats and emergencies. So how are we prepared to do that? Um, also looking at the quality of the services that we provide, how we can improve and maintain the, that quality. And ultimately, looking at how we strengthen our agency's infrastructure so that we can efficiently and effectively provide the services that we're responsible for. Part of those of looking at the effectiveness and efficiency is really looking at how uh, we're structured. And our board is at a committee that is focused on the centralization of our agency and looking at whether or not that would be a good idea, weighing the pros and cons for a couple years now. Uh, this year, uh, they spent a lot of time working about that, discussing it, uh, and they actually engaged a consultant to determine whether or not this would be a feasible endeavor. Uh, here in November, November 17th, our board did vote to pursue centralization of our staff from five offices into one. Um, our next steps are actually going to be engaging our town leadership uh, to really talk about the implications of this and, and plan on how to accomplish this as we move forward into the coming years. One of the big things as we look toward the future is how we, we as a public health agency become accredited. Uh, there's a voluntary national public health accreditation effort that's out there right now uh, and we've been working over the past year to really develop policies, both administrative and health policies, that will help position us for accreditation here in the next couple years. Um, part of that is really looking at performance management activities, like how we assure the quality of the things that we do on a daily basis, how we improve the quality of those activities, and really how we track the metrics. Uh, you know, are we doing the right things? Are we doing it in the right places? So with that, my last word is always thank you. Thank you for your support from the member, from the town of Weathersfield, from the public as a whole for public health. Uh, we generally, you don't hear from us a lot. We come by once a year or so, twice a year to talk to you. Uh, but we're out there every day doing the efforts to prevent disease within the community. And we thank you for your support. And I stand ready to answer any questions. Thank you, Charlie. Appreciate that presentation. Questions from council? Charlie, why is here? Jody? Yeah, we're good. I was just curious. You mentioned that you guys have registered sanitarians and inspectors and that it is difficult when you're dealing with hoarding issues because, as I'm aware, and correct me if I'm wrong, state law is, is really focused on multiple dwellings as opposed to a single occupant house. Yes. Is that what you're finding, and is there any suggestion moving forward that we might be able to try to help the process move along when it comes to that respect? Well, hoarding is, is really a multidisciplinary issue, and what we found is the best thing that we, that we can do when we address a hoarding situation, even in a, in a single-family dwelling, is work as a team. Um, so we work with code enforcement, we work with 
planning zoning you know our our folks in fire marshal's office and things like that to address the conditions of hoarding where we find them one of the things that's difficult is the fact that i have the public health code that, that we have the authority to enforce uh, but i can't enforce other things so that's why we have to really work as a team uh, to be able to accomplish the things there so um, it's really a lot of communication uh, making sure that everybody's on the right pa the same page and really looking at how we can address the underlying factors that cause the conditions as a whole one of the main things that's a big impediment right now is the lack of treatment there's not a lot of psychologists or psychiatrists within the state that are qualified to treat uh, people who may have a hoarding disorder uh, so that's something that at a state level, they're actually looking at trying to establish a task force to address hoarding as a whole uh, to see what they can do to provide resources at the local level so that we can be a little bit more effective at dealing with these situations. Thank you. Other questions from the council? Charlie, thank you very much for coming. Wish you a good holiday. Judith, thank you as well. And Angela, thank you for also attending this evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council. <coughs> Public comments uh, this evening for anybody in the public wishing to speak. Gus. Good evening, Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. I'm back. Uh, as you all know, except for a few ones right here, that uh, I've been complaining about uh, the need of a stop sign in Morrison Avenue for over five, six years now. And you know what? And the only answer I got is that Morrison Avenue does not have enough traffic to warrant a stop sign. And the other one, the reason I guess I'm more, I call it more of an excuse, is that we have too many stop signs in town, so we don't want to put any more of it. This is what I got from the town. Well, let me explain, because there are, I guess, you know, three new councillors were here that probably, they are not familiar with my dilemma. As you know, Morrison Avenue and Hillcrest Avenue are two adjacent and parallel streets connecting Walker Hill Road with Siles Dean Highway, just to the north of here, Morrison and Hillcrest. When Morrison Avenue was constructed, it was never meant to connect to Silas Dean Highway. As a result of past town decisions, Morrison Avenue was extended to Silas Dean Highway in 1955. Uh, Orchard Street connects to Hillcrest Avenue and Morrison Avenue. At Hillcrest Avenue, the intersection is controlled with three stop signs. At Morrison Avenue, the intersection is controlled with two stop signs. Keep in mind, Hillcrest and Orchard, three stop sign and the intersection. Hillcrest and Morrison, two stop signs. The average daily traffic on Hillcrest Avenue is 365 cars. Morrison Avenue has an average daily traffic of 730 cars, which is basically double. The pavement on Hillcrest Avenue is 30 feet wide. Morrison Avenue, has, the pavement is 24 feet wide. The snow shelf on Hillcrest Avenue is on the average of 15 feet wide. And all of these that I'm, and I'm mentioning, they tend to be one safer than the other. In other words, Hillcrest Avenue is much safer street than Morrison Avenue. Morrison Avenue has a three foot wide snow shelf except between Orchard and Tifton Road where the width is two feet to the north and no snow shell to the south. The most unsafe pedestrian location on Morrison Avenue is between Orchard and Tifton. Here the sidewalk is adjacent to the road with a mountable curbing. Mountable curbing means that if the car goes off the road, it's gonna be able to go over the sidewalk and hit whomever is on the sidewalk. In that area should have been a concrete curbing or granite curbing. The distance from the curbing to the front of the house on Hillcrest Avenue is 60 feet, 
and the distance from the curbing to the front of the house on Morrison Avenue is 35 feet. Why was it done that way? Because again, Morrison Avenue was never meant to connect to Cyrus D. The most, uh, okay. I invite all of you for coffee just to see in the summertime. You know, we can sit in my living room and have a cup of coffee and, uh, and we can talk, except when cars go by and the windows are open, you cannot hear. It's, it's noisy. Hillcrest Avenue has a drainage system and, and Morrison Avenue does not have one. Since the reconstruction of the sidewalk, Morrison Avenue has experienced washout east of Tipton Road. And I've been there now for ni since 1973. And before the reconstruction, I never saw a washout, never. Never saw any problem. Now, here is the, basically the legal things that nobody really cares to understand or address it. But the intersection of side distance for each orchard at Hillcrest is 344 feet to the east and 970 feet to the west. Remember now, 344. 970, it's, it's way above, so we don't worry about that. With two stop signs, in other words, 344 feet as a stop sign. The intersection side distance for Tifton Road on Morrison Avenue is 232 feet. That's all you can see. When you come out of Tifton and you look up, and you look up in the westerly direction, you can only see 232 feet. There is no stop signs there. But yet, an orchard, you see 344 feet, which is 110 feet more, and you have a stop sign. The intersection of side distance on Orchard and Morrison Avenue looking east is 290 feet. 290, which is much less than 344. And the police department has stated that the stop sign is needed in the westerly direction because you cannot see very far. You can see 290 feet. That's why you need a stop sign. I go along with that. Again, now, with a stop, with a side distance of 290 feet going uphill, you need a stop sign. But for 232 feet on Tifton, going downhill, you do not need a stop sign. And I asked once, I asked twice, I asked almost many times, why? And I never got an answer. And I'm still waiting for one. The Connecticut DOT manual on the intersectional side distance recommends that the required distance for the posted speed of 25 miles per hour is 280 feet. The posted speed on Morrison Avenue, it is 25 miles per hour. 280 feet? No. We can only see 232 feet. And also now, 25 miles per hour, the average or the, the 85th percentile of the traffic on Morrison Avenue goes 31 miles per hour. That means that 15% of the traffic on Morrison Avenue goes higher than 31. And yet the police and nobody right here realizes or cares about it to see if there is a problem or not. Prove me that I'm wrong and then I'll go away. Otherwise I will always be here. Now. Talking about the science again. Got, Gus, just to wrap up, because we're on the five minutes, I appreciate That's it. That's it, thank, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak this evening? Lee? Lee Sikis, 117 Wells Road. I just want to thank uh, some police officers in our town in the past week. Um, had two incidents. And, uh, one was where uh, the police arrived at the perfect timing. Uh, when somebody was, uh, you could say, uh, on the premises of uh, a prior crime, which uh, is taken care of. And another one was a car turning on a walk sign while I was crossing the street with the walk sign on and the police car gave that car a warning. I just want to say uh, cheers to the police, but uh, hopefully uh, people will learn to be more tolerant and considerate of pedestrians 
and uh, people should be learning to be more honest, uh, like in the first incident. But uh, cheers to the police. I just want to say thank you to the police. That's all. Thank you, Lee. Jim Clinch. Jim Clinch, 903 Ridge Road. Um, I brought this up before, but seeing Mrs. Katz is in, or Miss Katz is in the audience, I'll, uh, and nothing's been done since I, I brought it up before. I'm the owner of 105 Marsh Street, and there's uh, coming in Marsh Street. There's two culverts that come in, and when I bought the property, uh, the town uh, put the property line in the center of these culverts. So half of the culvert belongs to me, the other half belongs to the town. I've had the property for seven years. In, in the first five years, Jim McDonald, who was the director of the town garage, uh, I had no problem. Since Miss Katz come into town, she decided that uh, <coughs> she was only gonna cut a half, of the, half of the culvert. Now, my, my complaint is that the culverts are there for the, for the safety of the town. I mean, in case we have a flood or they were put there, I guess, for, for drainage and stuff. And she, uh, so I, I asked her about three months ago why they're only cutting down the vegetation on half. And she said they don't cut prop, private property anything. Now, Jim McDonald didn't have any problem with it. <coughs> it's a safety issue with the town. So when she gets up here, I wish you would ask her why. She, it, it's ridiculous. They come there and they cut half of the <laughs> vegetation, but the other half they won't cut. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. <coughs> Anyone else wishing to speak this evening? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to council reports. Do we have council reports? early in the process, but okay. Tony. Uh, since the last meeting, there was a meeting of the uh, Senior Citizens Advisory Committee. They're working on their spring program. Their theme this year is uh, making technology more friendly for seniors. Uh, and we were also advised at that meeting that the uh, housing authority renovations are still in progress and moving on and uh, the houses have been recited and fi fixed inside are, are looking better and that uh, Center Point Church will be having a blood drive on December 28th between 11 a.m. and 3.30 p.m. And uh, that's what was discussed there. Thank you, Tony. Other reports? Council comment? Any council comments this evening? Mike Curley. I have a couple. Well, one would be just that the let everybody know the Weathersfield High School boys are playing tonight. Uh, football, Class L championships, um, I did hear that they're down 14 to nothing about 18 minutes ago, but we wish them good luck. And this is for the town manager, and I think maybe Paul, uh, Chuck Carey's name seemed to be in the wrong spot in here. It was in the... Uh, yeah, it was on the list, but you can put it on the regular. Yeah, we're going to clarify it as an appointment on the... Okay. Yep, tonight. And Thanks, then Mike. the last thing was if maybe at the next meeting we can get an update on the uh, Weight Watchers building and the property there. Sure. That would be good. <coughs> Any other council comments? Uh, Donna? Go, first. <laughs> go yeah, ahead, Mike Rell. You might be going to ask a question. Yeah, go right ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, okay. <coughs> they were both going to ask the same Very question. Great minds think alike. Um, I had the uh, same question as Donna. Uh, special session is tomorrow, the legislature. I don't know if this is for uh, Jeff or for Paul. Um, just the concern with the um, Senate Bill 1 funding coming back into the town. Uh, it does look like, I don't know if the agreement or you know all sides have agreed, but um, under Senate Bill 1, when it was originally passed, $100 million would be coming into the municipalities. I think they're cutting 70 million dollars from that um, promised revenue uh, forecasted budgets over the next couple of years have us back into the red just wondering if uh, um, any of the towns would be held harmless with any of that funding at all um, 
and if we're getting kind of you know any updates from our legislative delegation. No. Oh, What's the question? Um, Is it going to affect us? Yeah. Would it's, even the even what was adopted wasn't going to be sufficient to cover the loss, particularly the cap on the motor vehicle would have to be made up a portion of which, uh, based upon our estimates, on the real estate side. So. Any changes in that funding formula are going to further exacerbate the problem unless, unless they take the cap off the motor vehicle and allow it to be a local option. We've not heard that, but there was one of the items in the governor's call back to the session that discussed local option taxation. So we don't know quite what that means, but uh, we'll have to see what happens. Have our mill rates dropped yet? I know there was two tier program or uh, um, uh, proposal. I think it was adopted. We were originally at about 38. We're town of Weathersfield's in the mid in the mid 38s right now. In the budget you're preparing, or you will be preparing next spring, starting in January. Um, you were we were to cap the motor vehicle rate at 32 mills with the expectation that there would be a revenue sharing out of the half percent sales tax that was set aside for local units of government. That was the expectation. Um, we'll have to see what that does. Now, the following year after that, the mill levy drops again to somewhere in the mid-29s, and that's where it's proposed to stay. Mm -hmm. After that, and again, there was supposed to be a, a uh, revenue share to make up the difference between where the towns would have been with the original, their own mill rates and the new capped rate. But we don't know what impact the special session is gonna have on that, if it, if any, so. Just in relation to that um, discussion point, I know that <clears throat> when we talked about this, um, when it first came up that the then town assessor did an evaluation of approximately what the loss would be based on real figures versus the projected revenue back to the town that the state predicted, and it was almost double, if I remember correctly. Um, so if they said they were gonna give you back 750,000 and the actual cost to the town would be one point, you know, that it was 1.5 million in revenue, we'd still be out on a good day, half of that reimburse, you know, that revenue coming back and would have to make it up somewhere else. But if they, I mean, and that's a significant difference. I mean, 50% is, it's a lot of money. We, we don't know today based upon that revenue sharing, if they will escalate the mill rates for a starting point to the most current rate the town has and then revenue share off of that or keep the rate they use to produce the estimate. So we don't know those details yet. So it could be a loss, it could be a wash, it could be whatever, depending on how it eventually gets implemented. I guess the point I just wanted to make was the estimate from the state perspective was not the same as what our staff predicted for the same number of vehicles Correct. within the town. I mean, that's, that's significant. And we recently updated that, and it's still consistent with what we found a year ago. Okay. I think the community needs to understand that. Other comments? I was just going to say, um, I'm hopeful that by the end of the week we'll have a better picture of what's going on up in Hartford, and I would hope that our delegation will talk to us and, and through you, maybe, Mr. Mayor, so that we can brace ourselves for when we are putting our budget together, because obviously things happen in different time frames, and we just need to be pretty cautious about that. Agreed. Um, for what it's worth, I spoke, met with Russ on Friday night after the special session they had, and he was communicating. He felt very confident that our municipal uh, support at both ECS and the other programs would remain whole. But 
obviously there's a lot going on right now. So he prompt pledges as does John and Tony and Paul to keep us informed and I certainly will pass on everything. I think there's been some material passed on to Jeff that he circulated this week, but we're all sitting watching obviously uh, the story. So certainly keep you guys updated. Other comments, anything else happening? A um, couple of quick things, just a, um, I think most, if not all of us, attended holidays on Maine last weekend, which was uh, extremely well attended. We heard there was 6,700 people um, in the Main Street area, Oval Wettisfield. Uh, so that was a terrific night, obviously. Um, a reminder that there is a salute to business on Wednesday evening uh, at the Country Club. I think invites went out to the full council and board. Uh, those of you who are able to attend, even if it's just brief for the uh, cocktail hour at 5.30 uh, or some portion of the dinner, uh, it would be great. Uh, certainly encourage folks to attend that. Um, just a quick report that uh, the two coffees we did last week were uh, well attended and we filled uh, two good sized boxes with uh, support for the open hearth, which I dropped off and the open hearth wish to pass on to our community their thanks for that. So a uh, pretty good um, support from the community. In fact, I just got another bag this evening from somebody, so people are still giving, so that's good. Uh, thank you, everybody that came and supported it. I know uh, some of our counselors attended. Thank you. And Tony kept copious notes, as he always does. So thank you. Mr. Town Manager. Thank you. Um, you mentioned it, but I want to bring it up. Holidays on Maine was a terrific success. I want to thank uh, the committee led by Chris Pace. This was her last year as committee chair. She's done a great job uh, shepherding this event for the past several years. I also want to thank the uh, Town of Wethersfield Police Department, Fire Department, Parks Department, and all the other uh, associated employees that participated in that event to, to really uh, have a good night. Uh, the line for Santa Claus was extensive. That's terrific that uh, <laughs> there's still that belief. It's wonderful at that age. And uh, just a great event. Thanks, everybody. And the Chamber of Commerce for bringing everybody together. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Um, just a, a quick announcement. Um, this weekend and for the next three weekends, there'll be uh, the trolley service running from Wethersfield uh, to Hartford and the Bushnell Skating Pond through the support of several of the restaurants, a couple of private businesses, and DECD grant money uh, uh, is going to be able to run for Friday and Saturday night for the three weekends up through the holiday, and, and there'll be three buses for New Year's Eve. Um, I believe the stops are going to be um, at uh, Carbone's, uh, Jay's Restaurant, uh, the Historic District in front of Lucky Lou's, and then of course the Bushnell Skating Pond on a rotating basis, nonstop, two trucks the three weekends, and then um, a third bus on uh, New Year's Eve. So there'll be a lot of publicity about it, I'm sure. Um, they're pl putting up publicity in front of the restaurants and in the district. Uh, but, you know, again, a very well-attended, well-used service, um, and thanks to the City of Hartford for their support for the skating pond. Dolores, anything? Um, the charter went, uh, that was voted on at the election uh, has been sent to the Secretary of State's office. Uh, Weathersville originally was an alternate for an audit on the election, which happens every year. Uh, after every uh, election, there's an audit done on the equipment. and. This year we were an alternate, but we ended up being called into service. So the uh, registrars are doing it tomorrow morning at 9.30 in the council chambers, and it's open to the public, of course. And uh, we just received notification that the Historic Documents Preservation Program for next year, uh, we will be eligible for $5,000. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Dolores. We'll move on to council action. Acceptance of resignations. Don uh, Donna? We do have one. It was What's that? We do have one. I know. Okay. Yeah, that's yep. been down. Um, <clears throat> move Thanks, that Lord. we accept the resignation of Diane Fitzpatrick, 40 Whipple Will Way, effective 12 7, 2015. Second. Second. All in favor? Um, Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? And then you have the appointment as well, Donna, right? Of Chuck? I, I can do it. If oh, you okay. Want. Sorry, Mike's got it. Um, appointment of Chuck Gary to the Weathersfield High School Building Committee, 358 Knott Street, effective 12 7, 2015. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. I'm sure we'll send a note to Diane for her service, uh, Dolores. Uh -huh. Thank you. 
We have no one to finish business. Can we do the list? Um, yeah, I, let me just mention um, in the packets, and I think the community will probably have uh, access to the copies of it. We completed the appointments for the major committees and liaison positions. Those don't need to be voted on, but they're being shared, uh, of course, with the council first and foremost, and then uh, each of the individual members of the individual uh, committees, liaisons, there are many uh, that are there for, for the public to see. Uh, all of you that have been appointed to specific committees and liaison positions, you should know that you'll receive notice, I'm sure, from your designated committees um, on the meeting schedule, and I'm sure we'll work with you to give you updates on where and when uh, in the next uh, week or two as they begin to schedule. Also, I believe Jeff, for the most part, includes them in the management report, so you have a little update what's coming when. Um, and if you have any questions about the appointments, the schedules, if there's any conflicts with any of the, any of the meeting times for any reason that might prevent you from, um, you know, completing it, just get back to me or Jeff and we'll, we'll make any accommodations for it. Um, Mayor, I just had a... Yeah, go ahead, Mike Rowe. Uh, actually, you brought up a good point. I had not been receiving the management reports. I don't know if any of the other... Uh, they're not reporting? The Friday reports. Yeah, no? No. Okay. I get them, I They've get been going out by email. Right. Last couple weeks, I have not. I yeah, have now that probably uh, since September, maybe. No, I think I've received them since then. Yeah, but I I thought right I'm talking about two or three weeks now, anyway. I haven't. Uh, so they're not going, you're not getting them by email either? No. 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 Yeah. Last yeah. couple weeks, but the, up until then, they were, they were coming, yeah. at least my. I don't know if it's when the, when the emails changed. Yeah. That may be the date. That could have been. We can check on that. <coughs> okay. Yeah, if you don't see one, let me know. We can get it, get it correct. And then just my second question on the liaison list, the Historical Society. Yes. Uh, I was the uh, liaison to the Historic District Commission. Our, I know there's been some consolidation, but I don't know if there's been a consolidation with the Historical Society and the HDC at all. Uh, I'm, I don't think so, Mike. I think we might have just left that off the list. I'm sure it would retain as you've done it with the district commission. Um, that's in, in Amy's area with, with the group. No, that's the uh, regulatory Kristen body. Sterling. Uh, oh, the, the actual board itself. Yeah, I'll, I'm sure that will be, they'll stay the same, but it wasn't on the list that I got to fill in. So um, I certainly want to keep you right where you are on that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Any other questions, concerns? Thank you. Sally, you're here for some information on disposal. How are you? Well, thank you. Sally Katz, Director of Physical Services. Um, before you, there are two pieces of equipment that we are requesting to be authorized to dispose of. They are exceptionally old pieces of equipment, 1990, which for equipment is old, not for anything else. Um, the, the cost to attempt, and I say attempt to repair them, far exceeds their worth. And, uh, and for one of the machines, we can't even get parts for it. Uh, and so we are requesting to be able to take them off of our inventory records. Can I get a motion? Yes, I'd like to make a motion to dispose by sale of surplus equipment at the scrapyard. Can I Second that. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Any questions uh, about this for Sally? It's fairly straightforward. And when would it take place, Sally? Once uh, you immediately, we've they'll, they'll made through, arrangements right that as soon as we were here tonight, we would move on. And, uh, and I believe you had one other one recently, maybe about a year ago, mm -hmm. or maybe two. And generally, you have a network of people that you use, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Some are auctions. Some are just scraps. Scrap, scrap metal pickup. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Sally. Thank you. What uh, Jim mentioned? Yeah, I think that issue that Jim brought up, I would ask, uh, I'm sure Jeff and Sally can address it with, with Jim. I don't know that we want to. I think we should yeah, we'll, <clears throat> we'll take a look. If need be, we'll have to do kind of a maintenance easement to give us authority to cut that grass? W do we go in with heavy equipment on that, Sally, or is it done manually? Uh, we've done it both, both ways. Okay. Depending on the growth, depending on the time of the year. 
and how it is. Is it? Yeah. So it's overgrown now. I assume at least on part of it. Um, it it can use attention. Okay. All right. So you'll I'll let you, I'll trust that you and Jeff will look at it. Thank you. Thanks for Jim for bringing it up. Okay. Bids for a. You gotta table that. Oh uh, yeah. I'm gonna uh, accept the motion. To, move to table uh, item four a. Second. Motion a second. Um, just quickly, we, there's a piece of that that we want to work on that I, I shared with our council this evening, so we're going to take a little time before and bring it back up on the 21st. Um, we have a motion to table and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. 4B. I think Keith's here for that one, so can I get a motion on 4B, please? There's a motion to... Accept the recommendation of the Weatherfield High School Building Committee and authorize the purchase of a Devo system from Valley Communication System for $43,590. Second. We have a motion and a second. And Keith is here. How are you, Keith? Thank you. Hope I'm you had good, a good Mr. holiday. Mayor. It's nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. Keith, <laughs> I'm sure you're quite busy, technology. right? Yeah, it's exciting times. One of the things about Weatherfield High School is a wonderful high school, but one of the programs that's been lacking is a direct result of the facility is the television production program. Uh, Community Television 14 has a wonderful program, but our facility has been lacking. And on the other side of this renovation, we'll have as good of a program as any high school in the state to, to expose our students to um, television production coursework, um, experience training, capturing events <coughs> in the school, capturing sporting events. And, and this piece here is gonna be integral uh, to that, but it also will tie into our curriculum and it, kind of does triple duty because it, it's going to provide our, our digital signage to the displays that we're putting up around the building uh, to scroll announcements and little snippets of video. We'll have, we have four of those displays going up in the CAF, one in each of the entrances, one in the guidance suite, uh, one near the uh, new gymnasium on the other side, kind of where the concession is. Um, so it'll uh, allow us to, um, to provide for digital signage. Also, you think about uh, YouTube, for example, and uh, all of the uh, tutorial videos and documentaries you can watch on YouTube, this server is actually going to kind of be our own YouTube, but safe with just our content. Um, and there's no rule or law that says that we can't have the whole school district benefit from this. Certainly the high school will be uh, the, the, the folks who use it the most, uh, but there's going to be enough storage on this server where we could capture all of our community events and store them on this server. Then once they're stored on the server, just like YouTube, um, you can access this video with any device, smartphone, tablet, computer, anywhere in the world, uh, through an internet connection. And we can password protect the videos that we want password protected, and then just leave some open. Um, so this is, this is uh, kind of an all-in-one video organization and streaming uh, solution. And one more benefit, of course, of this, I mentioned it briefly, but our, our students can take this Spirit device, it's portable, and you've seen, uh, I think, Rick Gary do it with Channel 14, but go to graduation, come here, go to um, the gymnasium and video events live and stream them live on the internet. So it'll give us uh, the ability to do that, too. Questions for Keith from the council, Donna? Um, just a question. I know that the capability or the, the existence of a production area is present at the middle school. Will there be work to kind of begin that? And I know this isn't, this isn't our question, but I'm just thinking it just brought the question to mind, um, the curriculum question of starting at the middle school level and moving up through the high school now with, with that kind of technology and um, ability to add that type of um, skill set. Absolutely, yes. And one of the things, our middle school actually is, is I want to say a little bit ahead of our high school because um, they, were, they were the first to get the iPads. We piloted the iPads there first. And the students use the iPads to capture video and, and they've uh, done a great job creating some, some of their own educational documentary students have. So, so the program there is, is, um, is starting to blossom and we could use this device for them as well. Right now there's not really a place for them uh, to store their video and this will be um, something that they could benefit as well. 
Jody? Hi, Keith. Hi, Jody. Um, I just wanted to find out, was there any talk within the building committee about doing um, or using the Devos to do some sort of digital signage out on Woolkit Hill, much like Newington has out on Willard? So any event, whether it be a play or a big game or something of that effect, is displayed on the sign outside that designates the school. Would that be something that this could tie into? It sure could, That's a, and that's a great point. I've seen schools that have that, and it's really, it makes for... Um, you're talking about the entrance of yes. the school. Yeah, it makes really for a nice, <coughs> informative tool for parents uh, to get some information even when they're just coming in to pick up their children and, mm -hmm. and so forth. So yes, this can tie in. Uh, because it's internet-based, we can access it from all our schools, but also it has some features that, uh, that we could work with the police department on as well, tying in our security cameras. And the web-based aspect of this is, is nice, but we could look into uh, the Wolka Hill feature. I don't know what it would cost but uh, to tie in, but it's, uh, it's definitely an option. It might be something to think about just as everybody is still formulating the end product. Absolutely. I'm just thinking out, like, about conduit and what's out there now for wiring. Can we get an internet connection out there? But I'll do some investigating. That would be great. Thank sure. you. Thank you, Tony Micro. Thank you, Keith. Um, just looking at this, uh, $43,600 is kind of a steep price for a YouTube subscription. Uh, sure. Does this include uh, physical uh, devices, uh, video recording? Uh, yeah, the large chunk of this is the server itself, which is 30000 of that. Mm -hmm. And that server is going to live in the head end closet at the high school where we have quite a few other servers, uh, as you can imagine, the, the new security camera. A server just just about everything these days comes with with a server this is a heavy duty <coughs> server uh, because video takes up quite a bit of space so we're talking about being able to catalog every graduation from now until <coughs> until there's uh, we get the idea all of the graduations all of the sporting events um, on this server so that's why that's an expensive uh, box that the, the 30,000 price tag but then the other device we get is the spirit which is that portable device that, that we can go anywhere in town with to actually stream live video. Yeah. I guess my question is, does it come with video cameras, um, you know, digital video cameras? I mean, if you, you had mentioned going to sports, you know, if there's football games like tonight's game or anything like that, um, or would we be using existing devices that the high school currently has? We'll be using devices that we've not yet purchased yet. We've spent 42% of our, the technology allocated for this new high school project. So far, we've spent 42% of that. Um, so we're, and I, I, the project is more than 42%, 75% complete. So I'll, I'll pass down a copy of this, but you'll see under. Michael, you'll see under TV, studio equipment, line item eight, cameras, mics, lighting, there's a $50,000 allowance. Now on each of these items, one through 17, uh, we've stayed under budget except for uh, the auditorium projector uh, came in over budget. But if you look at the savings and all of the other line items that we've expended to date, uh, we're under on all of them except for the auditorium projector, which went over budget by $7,700. Okay. And um, the hardware that's involved with this purchase that, that we're asking for approval tonight, the, get the exact amount. The $43,590. Again, the servers, 30,000. Then we have, for each of the displays in the high school, and there are 10, we have the digital signage encoder or streamer, uh, $850 each times 10 is 8,500. So that attaches to the back of each of the displays in the school, allows us to broadcast to those displays. Also gives us the ability to broadcast different slideshows to each of the TVs. We don't have to have them all uniform. Uh, the guidance office might want to display different information than the 
the uh, display near the near the um, gymnasium, for example. And then the spirit is 4400. And again, that that's where our digital camera will tie into and give us the ability to uh, broadcast events live. Also, uh, while I'm talking about the auditorium projector, this Devos will allow us to send content to the auditorium projector. So the auditorium projector is gonna be mounted in the mezzanine. There's a little cutout uh, in the mezzanine way in the back of the auditorium and it'll be able to broadcast up to the big screen on stage, much like if, as if you were in a movie theater. So the quality will be great and we could actually show videos through that or if we had all the kids, uh, we wanted to show them it was Drug Awareness Month and we wanted to show them some um, safe grad video, for example, we could bring everybody in and, and use the, the Devo system to broadcast content through the auditorium projector. Okay. So basically this, what we're voting on tonight is the, the nuts and bolts, <coughs> the hardware that goes into the, the school system so that when in the future the $50,000 or even more for some of these other um, recording equipment come in, they can tie right into that and then be able to project out. Yes, yeah, and, and actually you bring up a great point because while we will have some high-end cameras for the television production studio, the StreamZ allows you to broadcast video through any of uh, your devices. That includes iPads, smartphones, and you know the quality is getting better and better on, on these devices. So students can capture video, send it to the, to the uh, Devos video server with their own personal devices. So we won't have to buy high-end cameras for everyone to use. Uh, we'll just have some high-end cameras for the actual TV studio where we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully start a morning news program. That's one of the things that's been, we've been missing and, and the equipment and the facility is gonna allow for us to, to start to produce some content at the high school. Great. Thank you. Mike. Um, it says there's two hours of, on it only takes two hours to install this? Yes. Uh, okay, and then they're just traveling from Massachusetts, so I'm, there must not be any overnight stay. It says living expenses. Yeah, it's a weird, I saw that blurb too. It seems like they're gonna charge us for not included living expenses. No, okay. there's nothing like they're that. They're just driving down and installing it and going back. Yes, and the vendor we're purchasing through on the state contract, Valley, they're the ones installing the displays that they've installed the classroom projectors. They're gonna be installing the auditorium projector in between Christmas and New Year's. Um, so they'll also be there to support us uh, with this device as well. Is there a maintenance agreement with this? There is. We pulled that out of the quote and put it in our operating budget because we're going to have to renew that each year. Uh, it's about 4000 a year total for all of the, for the spirit, for all of the digital signage um, units, and for the server itself. When you say digital signage units, the monitors that we'd buy? The uh, device that goes behind, like almost like an Apple TV or a Roku device that we have a little device that allows us to send the digital signage through the internet to the device and then display on the TV. Both these TVs have little devices on top. It's basically that unit. Okay. It's proprietary for the Devos system. Jody. I just have a follow-up question. On number 10 here, the network hardware server, UPS switching and Wi-Fi. Yes. Getting ahead, but just wondering, what is the backup if electricity goes out? Do we have another source in order to maintain that? So the new high school has a generator more advanced than the one that we used to have. It's always had a generator, correct, the high school. Um, but we also have the UPS battery backup. So even if there's, God forbid, someone hits a pole on Silas Dean and power just browns out for a second, we have a battery backup that kicks in so it prevents our, the wear and tear on our equipment. When equipment gets shut off abruptly, it's not good for it, obviously, if it happens too many times. So we have the battery backup. And that gives the generator time to kick in, at which point we would regain electricity at the high school. Mm -hmm. And the generator, forgive me for not knowing, it just keeps going as long as you fuel it? Yeah, it's a new generator and it's, our high school is going to be one of the emergency shelters in town because of that reason. So it's, it's, it's a high-end device. Got it. I, I would defer to Mike and Fred on that, but I hear, good, I hear great things about the new generator. So often you, you hear of microgrid backups, so I was just curious if that was considered that or if it's a generator is separate from a microgrid. Separate, thank you. We'll be backing up the content on our server. We back up all of our servers. We have a Barracuda backup system, so we'll, we'll back up our, our data as well. Thank you. Sure. 
Keith, um, I, I saw the uh, the security piece as well, um, and and did the security director, Mr. Even, has he had a chance to weigh in on this? Well, the nice thing is the new security system has the ability to tie in um, to the police department even without this system. This system may allow us to do some, give us more flexibility with how we do that. Uh, but yes, Mr. Evans has been heavily involved. They've got the TV now mounted and the cameras are all uh, up and running now. All the wires have been punched down. They actually have uh, glasses, sunglasses looking device that you can put on and you go next to the camera you want and you look at where you want that camera to point and you press a button and that camera then goes. So you kind of can make sure there's no blind spots in the areas that you don't want blind spots. And it's all done uh, with glasses and that's pretty neat. Okay. And then just a comment on the, uh, um, I do like the use for homebound students. Uh, I've had a sick, sick kid for a, a little bit this year uh, in the last week or so. So to the extent that that is also a use, I, I noted that it's a, it's kind of Yeah, a, I thought that was really interesting. Thing. You could You could require students to watch a video and then you can track by whether they logged in and actually watched it. So uh, for distance learning, it's going to be excellent. Anytime we have uh, guest speakers come to the school too, we can capture that. If some of the grades weren't able to see it, they can, they can then see it on demand. That's amazing. Tony? Uh, Keith, if uh, kids uh, create a great production on something, uh, is it the kind of thing with the server, it could be direct feed, feed over to government access or public TV so they could be shown to all our residents as well? That's one of the things I hope this, yes, Tony, to answer your question. That's one of the things I'm looking forward to this solving. So right now we have a system where our Board of Ed meetings, for example, we videotape them here and then we burn it to a DVD. And we, we, uh, we have a couple people involved with that helping us. And then Joe, uh, who delivers our mail between building the building, brings the DVD over and then we, we, we use software to rip the video off of the DVD and then we upload it. And, all of this has a lot of people kind of spending time doing something that should be a lot easier to do. Uh, and this system will hopefully eliminate all of that. Okay. So we'll capture it instantly, upload it, encode it instantly. Um, so the, the Board of Ed meetings and any meetings we tape will be available sooner and require less um, hands. Mm -hmm. Good, everybody good? We have a motion and a second. All of those in favor? I opposed extensions. Thank you. Keith, I know uh, a lot of work been done over the last year and a half by you and specifically, and uh, I know you're very pleased to see this stuff come online and get the high school finished, and uh, we're very grateful for that work that you do. You've done a great job. Thanks, Ms. Barron. It's been Thanks, a team Keith. effort. Thank you. Uh, we have a resolution for introduction, which uh, is self-explanatory. Uh, the meeting of the 21st, there'll be a public hearing on that. So covers the public to see that. Jody. Sorry, I'm new. So what is the process? There's a public hearing in between resolution and a vote? Uh, this is an introduction of the resolution that we'll act on on the 21st. Uh, and this is a notice to the public uh, of the information which is available to them. And on the 21st, there'll actually be a separate public uh, opportunity to speak on just that introduction. And then we'll act on it, assumedly, on the 21st. And how will they be notified? Um, well, it's just published. Public, public. It's published. I think. Assuming the rare reminder, probably a notice. Were, were we going to publish this, Dolores? We usually put our, this in the in the rare reminder. And, and of course, it'll be on the it's town. It's posted. It's online. Yeah. It's all over. Yeah, generally. Um, and of course, the current may run some information on it in advance, or uh, or the rare reminder itself is a story. But certainly, given the number of neighborhoods. Uh, involved it might be good for council members to advise residents as you see them or they ask questions which I'm sure you're going to get yes good yeah no I was just curious of the process I just because I know in some respects people actually get like a notice in the mail is that one of these situations no, no? this one was not okay this isn't a zoning issue it's just a general action of the town council got it okay thanks thanks Jody uh, approval of the minutes. Get a motion. Make a motion to approve the meeting minutes of November 9th, 2015. Second. A motion and a second on the special meeting. Any changes, <coughs> additions? Mike? Um, let me just, I 
I feel like take a second. Stop the manus. It's gone like this. He usually does this. Uh, I had a question, or actually not a question, but just a spelling correction, and I need to make sure it's on the correct minutes. Um, take your time. Uh, it was actually for the November 16th minutes, so. Okay, we'll hold on that until we get to it, which is next. Any changes on the 9th? Seeing none, a motion is second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, abstentions? And now the meeting of the 16th. I make a motion to approve the meeting minutes of November 16th, 2015. Second. Motion is second. Thank you. And uh, Mike, you have a change on that. Yeah, just, uh, I had mentioned Jim Woodworth uh, was instrumental in the uh, the fee change at um, um, Weathersfield Cove. So on page five uh, of those minutes, it's mentioned as uh, Jim Whitworth, W-H-I-T-W-O-R-T-H. It's Woodworth, W-O-O-D-W-O-R-T-H. Thank you, Mike. It's noted, I'm sure, by Dolores. Any other changes on the 16th? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? And finally, the meeting of the 24th. Make a motion to approve the meeting minutes of November 24th, 2015. Second. We have a motion to second. Any changes, deletions on that? No? All good? Great. We have a motion to second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Let's take a motion to adjourn. Public, public, comment. Comment. Public, public comment. Public comment. Sorry, Gus, and I cut you off earlier. And I know you. I know you wanted to finish. You what? It can't be. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So no public comment. Okay, Gus. Nice to see you back. I know you think we don't love it, but we do. It's so captivating to hear about stop signs. Motion. Motion to uh, adjourn, please. Yes. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Thank you. Before the council, is the mic's off? No. Nope. Not yet. Uh-oh, TV off.